Good morning and welcome. My name is Zach Lampel, and I am Senior Legal Advisor with the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. On behalf of our co-sponsors, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Korea to the UN, the European Union and Microsoft, and co-organizers, Access Now, the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, International Service for Human Rights, and the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner, I welcome you all to this event. As the title suggests, today we will discuss private sector responsibilities to promote human dignity online. Protecting and promoting human rights and democratic values in this era of new emerging technologies is a shared responsibility, falling jointly on international organizations, governments, civil society, and tech companies. Today, we'll explore and discuss ways these actors can apply the business and human rights framework to emerging technologies to better promote human dignity and human rights online. If you would like to comment or engage in discussions, we invite you to do so in the chat function on Access Now's YouTube channel in the live stream. To kick off our today's discussion, it is with great pleasure that I give the floor to His Excellency Jeppe Kofod, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Zach. Thank you for, um, for introducing me so kindly and good morning uh, or good afternoon and evening to everyone. I wish to thank the, the Office of the um, High Commissioner Access Now, ICNL, and also ISHR for organizing uh, this um, event, uh, which recognizes the importance of multi-stakeholder push for promoting human rights in the digital uh, age. Uh, I'm also um, very happy to open this multi-stakeholder panel and to put greater focus on the joint responsibility of states and the tech sector to promote human rights and democracy. More than ever, technology is changing our world, transforming how we communicate, uh, inform ourselves, and also make decisions. New technologies hold great potential for promoting human rights, enhancing civil engagement, and supporting democratic institutions. At the same time, new technologies have dramatically changed the playing field of democratic governance. They pose severe challenges to human rights and democracy uh, online. These challenges are complex. They range from uh, non-transparent use of data-driven business models and algorithms to disinformation, internet shutdowns, and infringements uh, on the civil spaces online. To overcome these challenges, we must encourage closer cooperation between all relevant stakeholders and foster more exchanges on how we address these challenges with new solutions uh, and also identify best practices. Earlier this year, Denmark launched a new Tech for Democracy initiative to help ensure that the digital technologies work for, not against democracy and human rights. And the future of technology is in our hands and this initiative recognizes that we all have a responsibility to come together to develop, promote, and use technology to the benefit of democracy and human rights. Making best use of digital technologies is one of the more uh, and most pressing questions of our time. We need to keep the multi-stakeholder dialogue going and step up in our joint efforts to get things right. Today's uh, panel, contributes to that dialogue. And therefore, I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. I look forward to, to hear your um, inputs. So thank you so much and, and back to you, Zach. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Now we will hear from His Excellency Choi Jong Moon, Vice Foreign Minister of the Republic of Korea via pre-recorded video. Excellencies, distinguished guests, it is an honor to participate in this important event which aims to address the private sector's responsibilities 
to promote human dignity online. As we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has made us even more dependent on digital technologies, which have increasingly permeated all aspects of our lives. Digital technology is a double-edged sword for human rights. On the one hand, it has opened avenues for greater access for individuals to basic education, health care, and economic activities. On the other hand, however, the misuse of technologies can fuel the spread of misinformation, online discrimination, and even cyber attacks on critical infrastructures, which can harm the fundamental rights of individuals. The reality is that the possible benefits and challenges are not yet fully understood. It is this recognition that prompted Korea to bring this matter to the attention of the international community through Human Rights Council resolutions on new and emerging digital technologies and human rights. The series of resolutions highlight the importance of a holistic, inclusive, and comprehensive approach while emphasizing the need for all stakeholders, in particular the private sector, to work together to manage the risks and make the most of the opportunities for human rights. In this light, the tech companies in Korea have closely cooperated with the government to fully utilize the benefit of digital technologies in responding to COVID-19 while respecting human rights. For example, those companies issue QR codes through their digital platforms, which people use to easily register their visit to any place, then only the government can utilize such information on people's past contacts for public health purposes only, minimizing the exposure of personal information. Uh, meanwhile, global enterprises have also played their parts in promoting human rights in digital world. Microsoft, for example, has published an annual report on human rights since 2016 and has engaged with a broader community to protect human rights in their business activities. Uh, such voluntary efforts of a private sector to protect human rights must be fully encouraged. At the same time, their good intentions and due diligence would have to be backed by good institutions and method. Thus, now is the time for us to pay attention to how we could improve the and develop institutional methods through which tech companies may identify and address technologies potential impacts from the grassroots level. I believe through such efforts, the private sector would be able to demonstrate more responsible behavior and ultimately on better trust from the public. The Republic of Korea looks forward to all participants' invaluable insights and ideas on how private sectors could further improve their business practices that respect human rights, while the governments to play their own part to support them with the good institutions. Thank you. Our thanks to the Vice Foreign Minister for those remarks. I would now like to welcome His Excellency Eamon Gilmore, the EU Special Representative for Human Rights. Your Excellency, the floor is yours, and we thank you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, and um, uh, dear ministers, Kofod and uh, Young Moon and participants, uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, the topic uh, of our discussion, the interplay between new and emerging technologies, human rights and business, is rightly receiving more and more attention. In today's complex, intertwined and at times very chaotic digital world, it is important to connect the dots and it is important to assess fully the implications of new technological forces that shape our lives and the responsibilities of businesses as the key harnessers of those forces. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the digital tran transition, but it has also unfortunately fast-tracked the use of new technologies to suppress human rights through mass surveillance and cyber harassment, for example. States and non-state actors have an excellent basis to inform and shape policy action uh, or business activities. With the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the UN roadmap for digital cooperation, and of course, the robust body of international human rights law. The European Union has been involved in shaping and promoting 
these key UN guiding documents, and we are one of the world's most vocal advocates of human rights. The European Union's Action Plan for Human Rights and Democracy 2020 to 2024, which was adopted unanimously by all of our, our 27 member states last November, recognizes new technologies as one of the five priority areas of external human rights policy. It also aims to support the implementation of the UN guiding principles and to strengthen the engagement with the business sector on upholding and promoting human rights, anti-corruption measures and best practices on responsible business conduct, corporate social responsibility, due diligence and accountability. The European Union strives to harness the potential of new technologies, including artificial intelligence for the better enjoyment of human rights, as well as to tackle challenges connected with the rise of digital technologies. As our action plan puts it, digital technologies must be human centered. Over the last few years, we have established strong standards for protecting data privacy through the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR regime, or on combating hate speech online through the code of conduct with social media platforms. The legislative process is underway on a new Digital Services Act package, which aims to provide for a clear set of due diligence obligations for online platforms. A key objective is to improve user safety online while improving the protection of their fundamental rights. Currently, the EU is preparing legislation on artificial intelligence with human rights-based rules, regulating its design, development, deployment, evaluation and use. We are also working on new legislation, introducing mandatory human rights due diligence for businesses. As European Un Commissioner, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen underlined last week in her State of the Union address, human rights are not for sale at any price. It is encouraging to see more and more businesses espousing the same view, but more has to be done. With the growing range of human rights being exercised through the use of digital technologies, harnessed by transnational corporations, we need to redefine our strategies to protect those rights. We also need to acknowledge new forms of enjoyment and violation of human rights. In all of this, we do not need to redefine human rights as such. New and emerging technologies may be sophisticated, but the key human rights principle is simple. Human rights apply both online and offline. The same rights, whether political, civil, economic, social, or cultural, must be protected online. Putting these basic principles into practice requires joint efforts of civil society, human rights defenders, national authorities, academia, international organizations, and the private sector. The role of private actors, including social media companies, is of particular importance. And this is why the European Union has been regularly discussing with companies such as Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, and others, ways to foster a human rights compliant digital sphere. And I am glad that this event brings together these diverse actors and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for those thoughtful words. I now welcome Ms. Frida Roslin, Danish Youth Delegate to the UN. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, young people have often been referred to as uh, digital natives as we are used to conduct ourselves online and navigating the digital technologies. But even though we are accustomed to digital life and though the new technologies also provide opportunities, an analysis shows that young things are concerned with the rising power of big tech companies. And this is not surprising as digital technologies has become a huge presence in our existence with social life, shopping, entertainment, and much more being moved online. And with that, the power of tech companies is on the rise in a sphere with little regulation and a large impact on our lives. Young people are calling upon politician to help, politicians to help us ensure our rights and dignity online. For instance, it is vital that the market where our data is collected, brokered, and used to affect behavior is regulated in a manner based on human rights. And we also need to raise the digital awareness among young people both about rights and the mechanisms that operate online, because having and knowing our rights keep us from becoming incapacitated online. Governments and tech companies uh, need to partner up to make sure that we become online citizens rather than just online consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosalind. I will now give the floor once more 
to Mr. Kaufman to conclude this opening section of our event. Mr. Minister, thank you again. Well, thank you. And uh, let me also uh, thank very much uh, the initial remarks that, that uh, both Frida, but also uh, Chung Yong Kun and, and Mr. Gilmore uh, opened this discussion with. I think it's, it's setting the scene exactly right. Uh, and I really look forward to the uh, to the discussion and, and um, the ideas that, that can be elaborated here. So, so thank you. Uh, it is a, a pleasure to be with you. Back to you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. I am Peter Meisek, General Counsel at Access Now, and it is my privilege to transition our program towards interactive discussion. In the spirit of digital cooperation and in warm remembrance of the late John Ruggie, whose inclusive approach to change making as special representative on business and human rights may guide us, I welcome our panelists from civil society and the private sector, as well as our distinguished moderator, Peggy Hicks. Ms. Hicks is director of thematic engagement at the UN Human Rights Office, the OHCHR, who is a co-organizer of today's event. Peggy provides strategic direction to the office's work on pressing issues, including human rights in the digital age. To her role, which she assumed in 2016, Peggy brings experience in both New York and Geneva in civil society and academia. She supported refugees in the field and through legal work. Importantly for today's events, Peggy's call for a digitally secure and active UN human rights system rings louder each year. Her office's mandate is to protect all human rights through research, monitoring, and standardization, through empowering people to exercise their rights, including to access the UN, and through assisting governments to meet their commitments, and finally ensuring all UN programs center human rights. No small task. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you so much, Peter, for that warm welcome. It's just such a pleasure to be here among such a distinguished panel. And thanks to our, our opening uh, speakers who've really, as you said, set the stage so well. Um, I won't take up too much time at the outset. Uh, we'll have plenty of time and questions to, uh, to ask of our panelists going forward. But I do want to, to comment both as, as you have on the passing of John Ruggie, who's such an inspiration for all of us for this work. Uh, we, we really think of, of him and his work every day in terms of the, the work that we're doing within our BTEC project, which is about application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in the tech space. And so uh, it's with him, I, I think, uh, in the background above us uh, some way uh, that will uh, give us some real inspiration to the, to the panel and discussion today. Uh, for, for us at the UN Human Rights Office, the, the panel couldn't be better timed. Uh, all of us see the urgent need for these conversations. Uh, you, all you have to do is, is pick up a newspaper or turn into, tune into your uh, regular social media news channels, and you'll see numerous stories uh, that engage on these issues. But as Peter said, the aspect of it that, that we think is, is essential to bring into the conversation is how the human rights framework can really contribute to finding global solutions to global problems. And as uh, part of that conversation, what do we really expect out of businesses? They've become sort of the, the easy uh, scapegoats. Uh, there's a lot of finger pointing going on with regards to how companies um, have engaged. I appreciated Minister Kofod's opening statement that, that what we really need, of course, in a, is an approach that, that brings together business and states, each of which have substantial responsibilities and each of which I think we can all agree need to do much, much more in this space. So uh, looking forward to hearing the comments of our panel. And with that, we'll turn to our, our first panelist who we're very pleased to welcome, Steve Crown, who's probably known to many of you, is a Vice President and Deputy Council, uh, General Counsel at Microsoft. Um, and we really want to hear more from you, Steve, starting off with uh, these two upcoming events, which are, I think are going to be really important to, to move this conversation forward, the Danish Tech for Democracy uh, meeting that's happening uh, in 2021, the summit there, and the U.S. Summit for Democracy that's supposed to happen at the end of the year. We'd really like to hear more from you about what are Microsoft's hopes for outcomes at those summits in terms of corporate responsibility and regulation of the tech sector. Over to you, Steve.
You need to unmute, Steve. Well, somebody had to do that. Since I'm the tech guy, it makes sense for me to be the one not to unmute. Um, I wanna start by uh, noting that we have great hopes for both of these, uh, but I, I think the one we ought to focus on for this panel is the Danish event. Um, I capture all of this in my thinking with the idea of multi-stakeholderism. I hate the word, it's too big a mouthful, but what it really reflects is the reality of the way the internet, tech companies and societies and states as uh, uh, you know, res representatives and, and the people responsible for the functioning of societies, how we need to work together. The internet, we've learned the hard way sometimes, does not respect classic divisions. So it doesn't respect state borders. We see that all the time of things happening in one country affecting citizens in another. Um, it also doesn't respect the classic boundaries between states and enterprises uh, in that we need to solve these problems together. These are global challenges. And they're bigger than any of us acting on our own. So when I think of the uh, event that's coming up uh, in Copenhagen, it really is this idea of how do we come together with a renewed and more effective way of working together. Um, I love the idea of uh, I hoping to produce a call. As you might know, Microsoft's actively engaged in several of these, the Paris call, which was on cybersecurity and bringing uh, stakeholders, again, multi-stakeholder approach uh, we have then the Christchurch call, which had to do with uh, terrorist content on the internet. But this is not something that tech can solve on its own, and it's not something states can solve without deep collaboration. So um, I, I will finish on this one by saying we genuinely believe in this idea of the multi-stakeholder approach. And the way I think of that is we need to move away from what I call 20th century uh, solution making. And that was where companies would identify a problem, come up with a solution, share it with civil society and states, take feedback and then uh, adapt perhaps. What we really need is everybody to participate in defining the problem, making sure that we have the right parameters of what we're solving for, and also helping to define what an acceptable solution looks like. And we cannot do that alone as companies and we aren't, we aren't going to be effective unless we truly work together. So that's my, my high hope, Minister Coffin, for the for the event coming up, that we, we have that discussion and we actually think concretely and very practically what might we be doing together. And the same holds, of course, I, I know I'm short on time, so the same holds for the event in DC that uh, we look forward to on democracy. The same, same principles. Great, thanks thanks very much, Steve. I think that that's, that's a high ambition and one that, that we all uh, hope comes to, to fruition in, in those two summits. Um, I wanted to turn now a bit to, to Microsoft itself and the, your approach to human rights and the UN Guiding Principles application in it. Uh, Minister Choi spoke about the fact that Microsoft has long had a human rights annual report. Uh, and you also highlighted in your recent report the potential for discriminatory impacts through police use of facial recognition and that you've made a decision not to sell those products to US law enforcement at this stage. We wanted to get a sense of how the UN guiding principles played into that decision and, and then more broadly, of course, you know, how Microsoft looks at its role in, in bringing these issues to the marketplace and, and how it feels to be the one doing that when, of course, perhaps it's not something that's happening uh, across the sector as, as broadly as it might. Yeah. Well, thank you. The uh, one reality that we keep front of uh, our thinking is that very often interests are in tension. I hate the idea of human rights being in conflict one against the other, but they often are in tension. And so for example, with facial recognition, there's a tension between privacy and non-discrimination, but also public safety. We don't want a world in which there is no safety. We don't have absolute privacy. These things are in tension, but you need to be respectful of the various rights in play. And what I love about the UN guiding principles and why we find them so helpful at Microsoft is they really do call for this focus on actually understanding the technology, how it's being affected, and then looking at the most vulnerable. How are they potentially going to be affected by it? And very often with technologies, they get out there a little bit, we're ahead of our skis, as they say, and we actually have real harms, identifiable harms that we can focus on. That was part of what happened in the US law enforcement context. We knew very well, and we have uh, transparency reports we put on, on how facial recognition actually works, the proper limitations on it, what are the types of errors, but those were not being respected sufficiently in our view in the way US law enforcement was adopting the technology. 
We believe in regulation. We believe in good regulation, that is well-informed regulation that addresses the tensions and then serves the public. So for us, it was a call saying we would put a moratorium on our licensing of facial recognition software to US law enforcement until such time as there's a national regulation to address this very thing. We're firm believers in democracy. We think the democratic process is the right way to go here. We shouldn't leave it to the tech sector, uh, nor do we leave it uh, purely to uh, immediate responses to, to particular harms without pulling in those tensions that really are the, the role of governments and regulators. So uh, I would say with the UN guiding principles, what we most like about it is, again, this multi-stakeholder dimension is at the heart of that. There are states that have their duties, there are companies that have their responsibilities, and then this really clear focus on rights holders and their right to a remedy. So we, we use it throughout, uh, but it'd be uh, a much longer answer to talk about how it applied particularly to our decision regarding facial recognition. Great, thanks, Steve. Now that's given us a lot of insight into the question. And, and of course, my office, the UN Human Rights Office is fully in accord with the idea that technologies such as facial recognition can only be deployed in circumstances where we've managed and, and addressed those human rights risks that, that you spoke of and that the High Commissioner just last week uh, called for a moratorium, as you've said, on uh, application of artificial intelligence applications like facial recognition and, and human rights high risk settings until those guardrails are, are in place. Um, I also really appreciate, Steve, your, your discussion of the tensions that, that we see. I think you know, those of us in human rights really do want to bring those to a surface because one of the things we see is, is the idea that um, we come up with, with simple solutions to complex problems. And the reality is those are competing rights that, that all need to be recognized. And that's why we have the human rights framework to help us work through them. And the guiding principles, obviously, as a key tool in that space. Uh, thanks for your input. I I'll turn now to Isadoa Oreb uh, Haber, whose name I'm sure I have mutilated a bit. Sorry about that. Um, but we're really happy to have you with us. Um, she's the Business and Human Rights Lead at Access Now, one of our co-sponsors. Um, and I'd like to start, uh, Isadoa, by asking you a bit about the role that we see for investors in financial services sectors in promoting a more rights-respecting tech sector. Over to you. Great, thanks so much, Peggy, and you did a fine job with my name, no worries there. Um, but before I begin, I would just like to say thank you again to the co-organizers and the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, this is, I think, the right time to have this conversation, uh, particularly in light of the passing of John Ruggie, as was mentioned earlier. We really appreciate all he's contributed to this field, um, and, and we hope that we can honor his memory with this conversation today. Um, well, we've already talked quite a bit about uh, stakeholders today, and rightly so. Um, and I'd like to focus uh, a bit more on a different group of stakeholders that we haven't mentioned much yet, which is the, the investor group there. So we see that with new and emerging technology, with some of the issues mentioned earlier, like uh, artificial intelligence and facial recognition, that investors are increasingly um, paying attention to the use and the production of these kinds of technologies and where they are or aren't in, uh, compatible with human rights. But I would say that along with the, with the, with the moves by uh, companies with more attention from investors, we have seen, particularly over the past year, that a lot of the biggest changes regarding new and emerging technologies have generally been in response to big social movements. So um, Steve, you talked earlier about uh, Microsoft uh, moratorium on facial recognition. And around the same time, we had companies like Amazon and IBM make similar statements. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that those statements came you know, in June 2020, when here in the US, we had wide protests regarding um, racial injustice. And as, as we talked about earlier a bit, like sometimes rights could be um, could appear to be at odds with each other. But you know, I, I firmly believe that if there is any sector that has the resources, the power and the influence to address these issues, it's the tech sector. And as we explore more ways of using new and emerging technologies, whether it's facial recognition or other forms of artificial intelligence. Um, it's really incumbent on, uh, on the tech sector, on the tech sector actors like investors and others with uh, the power and the influence and the access to make sure that we're addressing these problems right from the beginning. Uh, so it, you know, in, in addition to 
just the the big tech companies that we think of when we think of uh, technology and digital rights we're also seeing that more companies than ever are becoming tech companies we have companies across the spectrum from housing to retail that are collecting more data and more information on individuals and as this data collection grows there's more uh, there, there's more opportunity for human rights abusing practices and behaviors so you know we really encourage everyone across the spectrum from private sector actors, whether they're investors or others, um, to companies themselves to work very closely with civil society to understand from the get-go where potential risks could arise with uh, new and emerging technology that they're considering or implementing um, and how to protect the people most vulnerable. Great, thank you so much, Azadoua. I mean, I think that idea of that broad approach that it's going to take take a village, I guess is the expression, but every actor within this system is gonna have a role to play. And I, I really appreciate your point that the, the protests following George Floyd's killing and the use of facial recognition and uh, crowd control and, and other settings is one of the most stark examples of where things could go wrong. And, and not coincidentally that that was going on at the same time as, as some of these announcements. Um, I also wanted to hear your thoughts on a, on a very recent development that obviously concerned many of us in the human rights side uh, regarding technology. And these are the uh, re revelations involving Pegasus and the NSO group. Um, and wanted to get your sense of you know, how that has exposed uh, the need for uh, further action to, to regulate some of the spaces around surveillance and other technologies as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Peggy. I'll say that with the recent revelations regarding um, Pegasus, the tool, uh, the software provided by NSO Group, what we've seen is that the effects of these are really wide reaching across the sector. So what might seem on first glance as an issue that is confined to uh, small bad actors like NSO or other um, generally privately held uh, firms, but we're seeing that this that the effects go across the range. So it's not just NSO using uh, tools that, that, that targets journalists, but also the other companies that are implicated, like Google and Apple, whose tools are the, uh, where vulnerabilities are being exploited from their from the devices to, to targets of vulnerable groups. So, you know, this is really, I think, a, a wake up call for the entire tech sector um, to step in and to use, again, their resources, the access that they have to make sure that these small bad actors uh, don't end up defining the entire sector um, there's really no good way to do surveillance without harming human rights um, and we're encouraging again companies like google like apple who find themselves in the middle of these conversations uh, to step up and ensure that we're setting human rights standards from the get-go and um, that can be applied to to respect people's rights Thanks very much. I, I like the idea of it being a wake up call. I certainly feel like we felt like that in the human rights office here, that these are some of the issues we've been talking about, but to see how they played out in practice and their broad reach and the effect on so many different actors uh, across human rights and journalism and elsewhere, I think it really did uh, make us all pause and think about uh, some of the steps that need to be urgently taken uh, in that space. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Anita Ramasasri, who's a, a good colleague of ours. Uh, she is, of course, a member of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, and, and in fact, the, the, I guess, now past chair of our uh, Coordination Committee of Special Procedures, so works very closely with my office. It's great to have you here, Anita. And we wanted to hear more from you uh, in particular about uh, the remedy side of the equation. I, 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 in my notes, I have that it's, it's called the forgotten pillar. It hasn't been forgotten uh, by you, I know, and by many of us, but that idea of how we can find remedies for these abuses. And uh, we see that the tech sector is starting to take some steps towards structured and non-judicial mechanisms. What, what do we see that Silicon Valley might be able to learn from the approaches that have been taken in other sectors like extractives or apparel when it comes to addressing abuses and what do we expect from, from the tech sector on the remedy side? Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Peggy. And it's great to see you all. And thanks to the hosts for putting together this great discussion. I do wanna pay my respects as well to John Ruggie. After a decade of the UN guiding principles, we have this wonderful tool and framework that we can use to address the issues we're talking about today. So as Peggy, as you rightfully mentioned, and I know BTEC has been looking at this issue through your office of remedy, but I think for a long time, the tech sector has been lagging behind sort of thinking that because you might have 
so many rights holders when we talk about services that are provided by the tech sector, that remedy was so disparate and diffuse that it didn't have the same meaning as it did for companies. If we think about remedy in the context of, you mentioned oil and gas or the extractive sector, they were kind of the first sector actually, one of the first to deal with remedy because if you think about a mine, um, for example, the harm is very tangible. There's a community that's impacted and so there was a greater compulsion to act because it was right there. I think recently we've dealt with supply chains and we've dealt with the issue of workers, right? Forced labor, workers' rights. Again, because we've now seen, the pandemic has highlighted this, right? The plight of workers halfway around the world that are making our essential equipment and so forth. So, and we've tried to figure out remedy for them. But what I wanna step back and say is that the guiding principles treat remedy very broadly. And what we can learn from the extractive sector and uh, textile labor and apparel or any other sector is that remedy includes human rights due diligence, right? That the prevention piece is really about that, starting at the beginning, identifying the impacts, and then taking steps to either prevent them or mitigate them. That's remedy, right? That that's remediation because either the harm doesn't occur or the private sector adjusts its business model or redesigns it or you know a moratorium, whatever it is, so that the harm doesn't continue. So I just wanna say that prevention and remediation through human rights due diligence is perhaps the thing that we can learn. And I think some of our recent revelations, you mentioned the Pegasus issue, right? Uh, so that's one where we think, you know, human rights due diligence, anticipating how the, the, these surveillance tools are gonna be deployed and taking steps at the beginning rather than finding out later about the harm is really what we would encourage. I'd say that again about, there have been a lot of revelations about the Facebook files over the past few days. And there I would say what we've seen is that the research, right, to some extent, the human rights due diligence was kind of done, right? That we saw all of these different impacts that were known. So human rights due diligence would, add, or the guiding principles would say, take that extra step adjust your business models uh, in a way that stops that harm that you now know about because you looked and you saw. So I think that's one of the biggest messages. I think the second piece, and this one, you know, again, I think we have to have discussions about what this means. Steve's, you know, and, and you mentioned multi-stakeholder initiatives. I think if we think of the Global Network Initiative, we now have, you know, the Facebook panel. We do have these kind of company-based or private sector mechanisms that are attempting to deal with both prevention and remedy. And so again, I think we'll need those kinds of mechanisms. But the second piece is that what the other sectors or other business models have gotten right is that you have to consult with rights holders. That's what the guiding principles say at the outset. It's not about consultation once you realize that there's a harm uh, and someone's been affected. It's about, and I think Steve discussed this, right? It's about when you design the business model at the inception, that's when you need to talk to rights holders. And I know this is gonna be a challenge for the tech sector, but it, it can be done to understand the application of that tool, whether it's an AI uh, algorithm or whether it is a surveillance tool uh, to understand what's gonna happen. And of course, that's gonna be different in different parts of the world. So it, the onus on a company is to, to sort of contextualize and talk to rights holders in these different contexts. So I think those are the biggest lessons. I mean, I don't think that operational level grievance mechanisms of the kind that we see on the ground for a mining company is gonna fit a, a, a tech company. But I think looking and asking which parts of the, those models work and which don't is very important exercise to go through. Great, no, I think that's that's really insightful, Anita. And I think, you know, it goes to show as well the, as you said, that that idea of the what it means to engage in a, a true rights consultation. And I think, of course, we've seen pushback around those issues. Uh, the most recent example that comes to my mind is is Apple's announcements relating to CSAM on its on its uh, devices, and that there was more concern by by some uh, of those commenting about the lack of discussion around it than on on the actual uh, decision to some extent. Um, I wanted to go back to Eamon Gilmer's point then about mandatory human rights due diligence and, and the EU process, and maybe to, to get you to, to explore a bit further um, how we're looking at that. One of the things we've emphasized is the need for, uh, for good models to be developed. Um, I, I see, you know, we've talked about Microsoft's role and the way they're approaching some of these issues, but I guess one of my concerns is how do we make sure it's not just you know, a couple of leading actors in these areas, but we actually engage the full sector. Uh, not, and obviously not just Western companies either, but more broadly. Could you say a few words on that front as well? Sure, and I think again, back to, uh, to uh, Eamon Gilmore's point, 
um, the working group and of course the High Commissioner's Office strongly support this move towards mandatory human rights due diligence. So I think what it'll do is hopefully level the playing field so that the companies, when they see that regulation is coming in, will join the conversation. So I think that's the first step, which is that it is bringing everyone to the table. And for those who've been reluctant, um, unlike Microsoft, let's say leading, that everybody will be there and, and we would encourage everyone to participate. The second piece that I think is gonna be important for the technology and ICT sector with mandatory human rights due diligence, again, because maybe the, the, this sector or broad sector has been late to the party, is that, and I know that the High Commissioner's team and BTEC has had a consultation around this issue, which is how do we actually implement a mandatory requirement? So if companies now have to engage in human rights due diligence and find out what harms they may cause through their business models, how do we enforce that? That's going to require two things. One is an administrative regulator or some kind of supervisory mechanism. And I think, again, as you say, Peggy, we can look to other models. If we think about, for example, I'm not saying it's ideal, but if we think about data protection, for example, and the, and the GDPR, you have individual privacy commissioners or commissions in, 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 in different jurisdictions that have responsibility for oversight and enforcement. And why those kind of models can work, and, and lots of regulatory models, is that if there's a systemic problem, then an administrative regulator, you know, we're not just talking about fines and, and, and penalties, but can actually sort of uh, ask for structural change, right? That there's a way in which administrative supervision can lead to, I'm a former banking regulator, right? That our job was to sort of say, okay, the business model is flawed, uh, so now we need to ask you to do something different. And we have an ability to continue to monitor that. So if there's a larger systemic challenge, then I think a strong administrative presence can be helpful. That's not to say, and I think this is where companies, I think, you know, are, are um, raising questions. But I would say, I think we need this too. And the guiding principle speaks to this, which is that civil liability is an important piece of this. So the guiding principles speak in, about access to remedy as kind of a mixture of things. Companies have an individual responsibility under the guiding principles to provide remedy at a more direct level that's non-judicial and that sort of hopefully will work. But backstopping that is the responsibility of governments to provide access to remedy through things like courts and others in case there's an issue that needs to be resolved. And as we've seen with recent litigation, you know, with internet shutdowns, and I know Access Now has been involved with this, when the government is actually the one that's the problem, right, deploying or asking a company to do something, having an independent judiciary there as a recourse is going to be very important um, as part of access to remedy. So civil litigation, I think, is still an important piece of the due diligence puzzle. Great, and, and I'm glad you brought up that point about the, the government role vis-a-vis -vis the companies and when they respond to company requests to do things that aren't uh, human rights compliant. And I guess we've seen a, a recent example of that that I know Access Now has spoken out on uh, regarding uh, Google and Apple's actions uh, around the Russian elections as well. So there's, there's plenty to be said on that subject and I hope we can come back to it. But one more um, point I wanted to raise with you, Anita, is, is the role of courts within this, you've said a little bit about that need for civil liability and, and where it takes us. I, I think one of the, the most ill-conceived comments uh, was uh, Mark Zuckerberg's reference to the Facebook Oversight Board as a Supreme Court, which probably set it off on the wrong foot. Um, but from our perspective, we've actually seen that mechanism, you know, pushing back on some of these issues in a helpful way. Um, and obviously, even recently, in response to the Wall Street Journal articles, really uh, saying they want more transparency and they're going to look at the answers they've been given to see you know, whether those answers really accord with the information that's now public. So how, how can we potentially have more oversight and what role do you see for courts within that? Yeah, well, I think courts are important. And if we look at other industries and this idea of non-judicial mechanisms, there is that fear, right? That you're privatizing justice and you're gonna have this sort of non-judicial body of experts suddenly becoming the ones that make decisions, right? As you said, this idea of this kind of uh, extrajudicial Supreme Court with the Facebook Oversight Board. That's where you have, I think, need to have uh, courts as well as these private mechanisms. Multi-stakeholder mechanisms are gonna to need to exist in the area of business and human rights because court systems around the world are at different levels and sometimes are independent and are not. And access to remedy, especially when we're dealing with lots of victims in different jurisdictions, may not easily translate into uh, going to court. So that's why we do have these privatized mechanisms and, 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 and that will always be a sort of coexistence. And that exists and I think everyone should realize like it's not 
not new in business, just in business and human rights. We see ombudsmen in the financial sector. We have all kinds of non-judicial things. What we should always do is remember that if a rights holder uses a private mechanism, the best practice is not to foreclose their ability to go to court, right? That at the end of the day, they should have a confidence that there's a judicial mechanism that, that they can seek recourse to if for some reason they feel that there's no independence or there's a problem with that privatized mechanism. So if we have that symbiosis, I think we can be comfortable. And I know that's a sort of broad answer, but I think that's the starting point to say that there, that, that court should always be a supplement and available to a rights holder. Great, thanks very much, Anita. I'm going to uh, turn now to our, our final panelist, Bruna. It's, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Bruna Martins uh, de Santos, a uh, uh, leading digital rights activist. Um, and a member of the Colegio Derechos Navere and a co-coordinator of the Internet Governance Caucus. Um, we know that uh, we've, we've said a few words already about uh, John Ruggi and his contribution, but one of the things that's really impressive about the guiding principles process was that it was, as, as Steve has emphasized, a, a true multi-stakeholder UN initiative. Uh, it involved consultations across the globe, brought in law firms, experts, um, and, you know, it's, it's we're looking now um, for how that framework fits today. You know, did that process hold up? Um, do we feel like the UN guiding principles are, are the tool we need? Um, but, you know, I guess importantly, how can we actually make sure that this tool is, is effectively implemented and used on a global basis? So, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this framework that we have um, and, and how to, to um, really uh, use it to, to make the progress that we, we all agree needs to be seen in this sector. Hi, hello, Peggy. Um, thank you very much for the question. And I'd like to, first of all, say hello to Access Now and all the organizers for, um, for today's event. And thank you all for the invitation um, and also congratulate the mem member states who co-sponsored um, this side event. Um, it is indeed um, a little bit sad that we're discussing um, the great legacy of John Ruggie's work on the week of his passing, but um, I also guess that um, maybe debates such as ours is a great way to honor his legacy and relevant work. So um, sad and, and uh, an important note as well. Um, and to answer your question, I, I do agree that um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are fit for purpose um, in the human in the digital age um, and still a powerful tool for guiding technology company conduct due to being internationally agreed and also supported by a diverse set of stakeholders, including business, government, and civil society all over the world. Um, over the course of the past years, it has become clearer and clearer to us, to us how human rights standards and principles apply equally online and offline, as we all have been discussing so far, um, including in spaces and discussions such as they, such as they conducted um, inside the Human Rights Council, the Internet Governance Forum, or even um, the full integration um, of discussions such as human rights due diligence into the OECD's guidelines for multinational enterprises. But um, when it comes to the problematic side of technological solutions deployment, we can see still some gaps um, to be addressed that need to be addressed in processes. And those gaps can also be seen as enablers for the dominance of social media platforms over public speech or even their abuses, um, the expansion of state power through the use of information communication technologies and the their ever-growing data collection practices in order to control the population. Um, and, and some of the problems we can see in, in these cases can be the lack of appropriate um, remedies. And in light of that, I truly believe that the UNGP can provide this useful accountability regime with, with its focus on human rights responsibilities of both states and companies, including um, digital technology firms. But um, for its application to be relevant and fit for purpose in the digital age, um, I do believe that um, these conversations should continue to be taken under the multi-stakeholder approach and not focus solely on the technology developers themselves or the companies, but also on governments and their willingness to work with um, CSOs and the private sector. Um, in this point specifically, I would like to stress that um, a multi-stakeholder engagement that centers the voices of civil society organization is key for us to ensuring the needs and interests of users are at least heard. And, and for that, we still need to improve member states and CSOs relationship and cooperation at the UN level. 
Um, another one last thing I would like to to like to point out here is that we still need to continue these clearer conversations with the tax sector and other stakeholders about their impact on the right to freedom of expression, movement, association, and assembly. Um, we should be able to have more structured means, such as the human rights due diligence, to decide when not to engage in efforts to develop new technologies, such as facial recognition or anything like that, when the risks and potential harms, they outweigh the benefits. And um, in that point specifically, any stronger commitment from companies in terms of complying with the principles itself or including the adoption of the, the human rights impact assessments and publication of transparency reports can be um, really useful for society um, in general. So I, I would answer this first question um, in that note. Great, uh, Bruna. I, I'd love to have you expand a bit on that point because I think it's something that's, that's not really picked up as much um, in terms of how we create a level playing field that really allows that civil society voice to be heard. Um, we, we've got the UN General Assembly going on, which is not an accessible space for civil society currently. And as you commented, some of the people most directly affected by these practices are people whose voice is silenced very directly um, and not able to engage. I also worry about the resources issues. We've talked about you know, areas like technical standard setting where you know, there just isn't space for, for civil society groups and NGOs to be involved as much as we'd like. What, you know, based on your experience, what are the, some of the ways that we can really better support civil society engagement in this sector in a way that will allow that voice to be heard more effectively? Yes, um, thanks for the second question, Peggy. Um, we have been discussing this access now, um, Internet Governance Calculus and a lot of other civil society organizations. This has been a very common conversation between us um, with regards to the digital cooperation roadmap, um, because we did see the need for us to like um, find better, fine line the conversations and improve um, our sector's knowledge about um, these discussions in like in a more high level um, kind of way. But because what we see in the end, it, it, it's that that is definitely the case. Um, funding is still an issue. Having access to these spaces and discussions can still be can still be very hard um, due to issues such as language, distance, and also um, like this whole set of discussions that are that have been enabled through the pandemic. Um, so um, access is still is still an issue that we have all been very much. Um, um, like compromised and improving. And um, in the end of the day also, um, we also believe that it's kind of, it's one of the government and member states tasks to enable good CSO participation just, and that is just not down to like participation for representativeness, but also like high level and, and, and like making sure that everybody is heard in this and, and that the, the true multi-stakeholder engagement cannot, cannot can only be fully respected if we have this level of participation. So um, I'm not sure if I'm like truly answering to your question, but then um, yeah, just assessing the, the issues about funding and participation and like bridging all of those gaps and limits between civil society organization and the rest um, can be one way to ensuring everybody gets um, a seat at this table, or at least like a few people get more. Right. No, I, I think that's I think that that's a very helpful answer, Bruna. And and I think it goes back to Isadua's point as well about the resources and, and the the I, I like the optimism in her comment that if there's any sector that can do it, it should be the tech sector. They've got they've got you know the profits, they've got the commitment theoretically amongst uh, some of the, the leadership here, and we've certainly heard it. They've got workers who have come out and said very much that they want to work in human rights compliant companies. So there are some key ingredients there to, to make these steps happen. And, and if all of those actors recognize that civil society's voices are, are important to be part of the conversation for the reasons that Steve Crown said, um, in terms of really understanding the impacts of these technologies on the people most affected, then, then you know, we have to believe we can make it happen. Um, that's the, the end of our speakers. We're gonna maybe do a lightning round at the end uh, with a question to all of you. I'll give you a chance to think of it uh, while I turn to one uh, intervener from, uh, from the group here, um, the lightning round is going to be around one idea or outcome that you'd like to see come out of the, the upcoming uh, Copenhagen uh, Tech for Democracy Summit. So if everybody could, could think about that quickly. 
And uh, before we do that, I'd really like to turn to Paul Edwards uh, from the UK government who's with us, who uh, kindly consented to come make an intervention from the floor and give us some thoughts. Paul? Hi, uh, thank you very much to, to you and the organizers and the panelists for such a rich and fascinating discussion. Uh, I learned a lot today and it was just really good to hear such experts on, on these issues. The United Kingdom welcomes discussions like this and welcomes this discussion and the opportunity to mark the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. A lot has happened in those 10 years, particularly in the digital sphere. In 2010, there were just under 2 billion internet users. And this year, the estimates are that it's uh, 4.5 billion or more. This sort of exponential growth highlights the importance of the internet. And as the internet access grows, so does the use of new technologies. And as others have said, international human rights must exist equally online as they do offline. And increasingly, human rights and democracy are exercised online. The digital sphere provides an enormous opportunity to strengthen individuals' enjoyment of human rights, but it can also have the opposite effect. Digital authoritarianism is a rapidly growing phenomenon, and we must stand together to push back against this insidious trend. We should build consensus around how governments and other actors collaborate. And we must establish a sustained dialogue that fosters government to government and government to industry discussion to help ensure digital technologies support open societies and fundamental freedoms. This is why the UK made digital a central feature of our G7 presidency this year and why we want to work closely with others to realize the global benefits that digital transformation can make, including in a development context. As has been shown by the conversation we've had today, we're far from alone in seeking the right balance between freedom and control and between innovation and regulation. We welcome the forthcoming Tech for Democracy conference in Copenhagen. The US hosted Summit for Democracy and the discussions here today and others. And we welcome the vital role that civil society plays in highlighting the risks and opportunities. And we welcome all they do to ensure that governments and others live up to their responsibilities. Now, while it may be hard to predict what technological developments will be a part of our daily lives in the next 10 years, we do know that by working together, we can ensure that the rights and freedoms that all individuals should enjoy are not diminished, but strengthened. Thank you again for giving me the chance to, to say some words. Thanks very much, Paul. No, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to hear uh, from you and, and to, to get those reflections on how we can take this work forward. All right, so we're going to turn to our lightning round, and I think I'll, I'll go in reverse order if that works for all of you. So that means, Bruna, the spotlight is back on you. Um, just give us a sense of, you know, this is going to be a moment in time where a lot of the big multi-stakeholder actors are gathered. You know, what's one thing you'd really like people to really be thinking about there or one outcome that you'd uh, like to see from, from that meeting? Um, I guess that, um, first of all, this, this, this growing understanding that um, we can all assess the newer technologies together. It's not just like a, a purpose or like a, a goal just for the sectors itself, but we can do this assessment in, in a more like joint and collaborative ways. And, and for that, we need to uphold to every single like multi-stakeholder principles and, and the whole system itself as we should. And um, on a second note, like maybe um, this common understanding that um, technologies can enable democratic and authoritarian contexts. And, and for us to be able to offer the proper remedies and so on, we need to be more um, like um, to dive into it more further and, and with like develop a more um, critical assessment on, on the issues and, and how they can no longer be just like neighbors of um, good development and so on. So that would be my, my main outtake from this. 
That's great to hear. And, and, and that point about how this technology can be used in different places is one that I think is so important. And, you know, I think the, the lesson learned from Facebook and Myanmar always comes to mind there where if you don't have uh, people who can even translate the language, you're not going to be able to understand the, the ultimate impact. And, and again, resources, making sure that, that, that you're bringing in that context and expertise and that that is an expense. It requires actually committing to do it. Um, so yes, a very good outcome there. Um, I think then, uh, Anita, you were next, right? Yeah. So again, I think for me, it's back to the guiding principles. And I think a commitment, you know, we heard at the beginning, which is, of course, true that technology is a force for good. And there's so much about positive contributions to human rights that we can reflect on. But we also just always need to reflect on the fact that there can be harm as well, and that we need to use human rights due diligence as sort of a baseline uh, for addressing um, that piece as well. So uh, accept the positives, but focus a little bit more as well on the potential for harm to rights holders. Great, thanks very much, Anita. Zadua, over to you. Uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of two parts. Um, first would be to encourage the stakeholders present there to think creatively, um, to think about the sector, not just as it is now, but as it will be in five, 10, 15, 20 years. Because we see that the tech sector, I think probably more than any other sector, moves very quickly. And when we talk about new and emerging technologies, things are being developed all the time. So I'd really encourage everyone to, to think uh, creatively uh, when we're coming up with solutions to promoting human rights in the tech sector about what this, this will look like uh, down, down the road. Um, keeping in mind that there are different kinds of companies that will be tech companies, right? I mentioned earlier that every company uh, can be a tech company. Um, and also a bit to a point that Bruna made, um, realizing that while we, while we watch what companies are doing in authoritarian regimes, we should also watch what they're doing in democratic states as well. Um, keeping in mind that it's not going to just be, you know, in other parts of the world that will deal with these issues, but right here at home as well. Great, thanks very much. Um, and over to you, Steve. Well, thanks. Um, since the gathering is really about human rights. I think one of the most important things we need to do is to double down all of our investments in the UN guiding principles. The worst thing we could do is say, those don't work, we need something new and try to create a new regime uh, in this environment. And as I think about what we could be doing, there's this notion in the UNGPs, I think that it's really about diligence, understanding problems, and that does mean multi-stakeholder defining problems, uh, but then it's responsible business decision-making one of the things that, uh, Peggy, you've heard me talk about probably too much is uh, my belief that actually we need to take this notion of due diligence and apply it not just to companies the way the UNGPs do, but maybe think about governments as well as we start regulating the internet and flows of data, uh, information laws, that sort of thing. What are the decisions being made? What are the tensions being moderated and why are we getting there? Because another key component of the UNGPs is transparency. And I think our opportunity to do more collaboratively and together rather than adversarially is really turning on this notion of do we understand each other and are we being transparent of what we're solving for and what are the things that we're doing and what are the costs that we're willing to accept because of the benefits that we think this will yield. And I think we have opportunity to do much more together collectively and collaboratively. Um, let me just say that I, I said that this was about the human rights and of course, since I'm in a tech company, it's the classic thing of if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I've been talking about these digital challenges, but we have you know, climate change and the opportunity for tech and government and civil society to be working together on that, or you know, the digital divide. Uh, I don't recall who mentioned it. It might have been uh, Minister Coffin that without access to the internet, you really don't have a full human life and experience that uh, should be the right of everyone in our century. Uh, we have the pandemic, we have uh, information flows on the internet and what that means for democracy, which is another way of saying what that means for citizens' rights and enjoyments of human rights. So uh, it's a very broad range of opportunities, but I think our best opportunity to go after that manifest set of uh, challenges is to double down on the human rights uh, tools that are in our hands that we've started to work pretty effectively with. I know the Office of Human Rights is doing a lot on how we apply these specifically to the tech sector, I think that ought to be an informing part of the uh, 
together. Thank you. Great, Steve. No, I think that I think that's really helpful. And and I probably could have asked the reverse question, which is one thing: don't you want to see happen? Um, because I think I heard a bit of that from all of you as well. That you know we don't want to sort of recreate new sets of, of, of ethical guidance or something that that you know does in a in a softer way what the human rights framework already gives us. Um, I think Anita's comment that you know we and Steve as well, that this idea that that double-edged sword that is comes into every conversation and, and uh, Minister Choi brought it up earlier that we we always have to have our, our eyes on what can we, you know, and we in the human rights office think of this, what can we get from tech? How can we use tech to actually solve problems and address the, so many of the things that, that we face? Um, but at the same time, um, being very much aware that unless we do that in a human rights compliant way, we're just going to make all those problems much worse. And you gave us a good litany of what they might be. Uh, Minister Coffin, it wasn't on the agenda, but since we were talking about the summit, uh, I wonder if you might want to, to give us your thoughts of, of one thing that you'd like to, to see following the conversation. Well, first of all, it's been extremely interesting. Thank you all for, for that uh, very valuable contributions. Um, no, I, I think uh, there's many good ideas already uh, elaborated on, on, you know, on things we could discuss uh, at the conference in, in Denmark um, and also further on. Um, what I want to say is a government, I think it's important we bring stakeholders together uh, and we will, from Danish side, do what we can. Uh, I think this, just this discussion today shows how, how important it is that we have both the tech industry itself, we have, uh, of course, uh, civil society, governments, uh, investors and others. Uh, and if we bring them together, I think we can go deeper down in some of the issues that, that was discussed today. So, so I look forward to continue the, the work with all of you. Thanks. Great, thank you. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up a bit now and, and say a few words about some of what I've heard from all of you. I mean, I think one thing I, I'd like to put on the table is, is really sort of three challenges in, in taking this conversation forward. I think there is, you know, I heard a lot of consensus amongst the statements amongst this group. And that's encouraging to some extent because it means that we do have this really common understanding of some of the challenges that we face and, and some of the steps that need to be taken to address them. Um, but maybe it's this virtual bubble that we're, we're doing this meeting in as, in as we are in so many, but I worry that, that we need uh, to, to take this conversation uh, to a broader audience and to engage in a different way across a lot of different uh, uh, geographies. The first, of course, is across borders. I referred earlier to the fact that, you know, we tend to look at these questions from a perspective of what actors like Microsoft can do. And the reality is, of course, that there are tech providers that are not Western companies, and they are big, and they are present, and they are not necessarily going to approach how we solve these issues in the same way. Um, and how do we best bring this conversation forward in a way that makes sure that those actors, too, uh, bring in the UN guiding principles and adopt it and, and, and uh, really look to implement it in the way that we would like. So, you know, how do we take this, this conversation across borders? I do think that the, um, the, the UN frameworks are really useful in that regard. I mean, that's why we shouldn't try to recreate them, I think, because they already have buy-in from, you know, countries across the, the geographic and political spectrum, but we need to talk more and bring in more actors from different uh, geographies if, if this conversation is really going to move forward in the way that we'd like. I think we also need to talk across companies. I, I really appreciate Isidore's uh, comments about the who is a tech company and, and how do we have the conversation in a way that brings in, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies that have uh, an influence in, this, in these spaces now. And how do we have a conversation that is not just with the biggest actors, but with um, a much broader range of companies. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is that if, if a, a company like um, Twitter only has, you know, two people working on human rights full time, you know, what, what can we expect from, you know, these smaller companies? Twitter's probably not the best example because it's one of the smallest ones of the big ones, but okay, so Facebook has a team now of, of I don't know how many, three or four. Um, you know, it's we need to we need to really think about what it what it takes to bring in human rights at a uh, small and medium uh, enterprise level, and and how do we do that better? Um, and then also, I think you know how we bring in, as we have talked about more explicitly, um, all the different actors that need to be at the table, um, including civil society in that conversation. And then finally, so that across all those geographies. But then thirdly, how do we do that at speed? 
um, because of course we have this sense that you know that these are urgent issues and and that's why these calls for moratoria on uh, use of artificial intelligence and in law enforcement and, and other things come up is that as Steve said we are moving forward more quickly than these frameworks and regulatory approaches and uh, implementation of the guiding principles allow us to, and and as Facebook uh, itself, I'm sorry to refer to them so frequently, but uh, the the early model of move fast and break things doesn't seem to have really disappeared. We are breaking things in the way that we're moving forward now, and we need to put in uh, these guardrails, and we need to do it at speed. So that's a big challenge for this upcoming uh, Copenhagen summit and the U.S. Democracy Summit and all the summits that are happening in all the other places across the globe that we haven't mentioned. There's a lot of work to be done. I know we have a, a really inspired group of activists and academics and uh, government officials and tech uh, company officials who all want to, to move this conversation forward. So uh, really grateful to all of you for taking the time to, to think through these issues with us today to our wonderful group of, of uh, co-sponsors for this event, to Access Now, who I think uh, has done as, as usual, just an, enor an incredible job in getting the tech side of, of all of this right, proving that even a tech event can be um, well handled on the tech side, which doesn't always happen. Um, but thanks to all of you for joining us and uh, looking forward to further conversations as we go forward on these important issues.